Well, I want to start off this morning by kind of asking you um, about two possible scenarios that that oftentimes we may find ourselves in. In fact, I think probably all of us have, at some time or another, been in one of these two situations, or or, or both, actually. And uh, so... I want to ask you these questions. One, first question is, has you, have you ever been uh, denied a reward for something that you really believed that you deserved? You know, maybe it was something like a raise or a job promotion at, at your work. Uh, maybe for some of you students, uh, it was that you felt you deserved a better grade on this paper or this assignment, or this, this test or exam, and, and uh, the teacher didn't give you that better grade, that it, even though you felt that you deserved it, that you had, you had earned it. Maybe your life group submitted what you felt, believed in your heart, was clearly a superior entry into the church selfie contest, and it was not chosen as one of the top three by the impartial judge. And you're not bitter about it, right? You know it was rigged, I think, but um, no. Um, no. It, you ever had situations like that where you, where you were denied something that you really believed that you had coming to you, something that was good, a reward? The other question is, have you ever had one of those kinds of situations where you did not get a consequence, maybe a negative consequence, that you really knew that you ought to get? So maybe uh, you get pulled over by an officer as you're driving down the street, and you just know that you ran that stop sign. You did a little rolling California stop, and you know that you, li- you know, technically you broke the law. And uh, so you know that the ticket you're getting is, is one that, or the ticket you're not getting, because this is the scenario is you're not getting what you deserve, right? Um, so that you know that um, you deserve this ticket, and yet the officer says, you know, do you, know, you notice there's a stop sign back there? And you say, yes, officer, I do. I did realize that there is a stop sign there. Did you uh, realize that you didn't stop completely at that stop sign? And you say, yes, I, I did not completely stop. And I'm guilty as, as charged. And you, you take your, or you, you're ready to take your, your uh, ticket, take your just punishment. And the officer says, well, you know, this time... Just this once, I'm going to give you grace. And by the way, as I go on ride-alongs with uh, police officers here in Beaumont um, with my chaplain stuff, um, they do this all the time. So if you just play good, you know, like just admit, admit that what you did was, don't say, you know, it's, it, why should I have to stop there anyway? That's a stupid place for a stop sign, you know? <laughs> just, just, say, just say, you know what, yeah, I blew it. Nine times out of ten, you're going to get off with a warning. Okay, don't tell them I said that. My pastor said that if I said this, I don't have to get a ticket. I just get a warning. Don't say that. There's probably something illegal about that. I don't know. Um, but I've seen that happen so many times. That's, it, it, maybe that's happened to you before. Maybe it hasn't, and you would, you're just waiting for that to happen. I don't know. Um, but, uh, or maybe, um, let's say, okay, for you younger folks that are here with us this morning, um, maybe you've experienced uh, situations that where you have received grace from your parents on occasion. Maybe just once or twice in your life. Um, but you've received grace when you know that you should have gotten in trouble for whatever it was, you know, harassing your sister or, um, you know, doing whatever it is that you should have gotten punished for, but you didn't. Well, those are situations that that happen, I think, for, for all of us. We experience those, those kinds of things. But here's the difference, I think, that, that you see between those two things. Especially if in the first case, um, we are just adamantly, um, you know, set on that we should have received whatever this reward was. But here's, here's really the difference between the two. Uh, in, the, in the first uh, instance, the one, one says... I'm worthy. I am worthy. And in the other, the person says, I am unworthy. I am unworthy. And that is what we're going to be looking at uh, when we look at Luke chapter 18 this morning. So take your Bibles, and I hope you brought your Bibles this morning, or your devices, 
and turn to Luke chapter 18, because this, here we see a little bit of a, uh, where Jesus is telling a parable. It's a parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And in this parable, Jesus is teaching a lesson, as he does, as we've already seen, um, as we've looked at par- parables previously to this, uh, to today, um, where he's tr- teaching a lesson, and it has, a, a, it has to do with God's kingdom. It has to do with what it is ultimately, at the end of the story, um, who it is that is able to be all in in God's kingdom and who is not able to be. Um, it's, it's about... What is, it, what is required for entrance into the kingdom of God, for entrance into the family of God, the, the, the church? And so uh, here, here uh, we see that, that, that basically the, the theme of this story um, is uh, really contrasting spiritual pride uh, or with, with spiritual humility. And then talking about the consequences of both. So spiritual pride versus spiritual humility and the consequences that we see um, f- coming from both of those. Now, here's, here's Jesus, before we get into the passage, here's kind of Jesus' um, way of operating um, throughout his ministry and even today in, in our lives as we experience his work in our lives. Um, Jesus often, or all, actually always, extended grace or extends grace to those who were humbly repentant. That's just what you see Jesus doing all throughout his, his ministry. Uh, and we've seen that illustrated in some of the sermons that we've heard recently. Uh, we saw how the centurion, the Roman centurion, who, who uh, wanted to ask Jesus to, to, uh, to come and, and perform this miracle, do this healing, and he, said, he comes to him and says, you know, I'm not even worthy to have you come under my roof. And so that's, a, that's kind of this humility that, that um, we're, we're going to see depicted in, even in this parable. And yet Jesus not only comes to his house, but he performs a, a great miracle. We also saw it in, in how this woman who comes to Jesus uh, when he, he is having this dinner, um, invited to, to this dinner by Simon the Pharisee. And this woman just comes, and what does she do? In her humility, she comes to Jesus, and she goes to his feet, and she washes his feet with her tears, and, he, and she dries his feet with, with her hair. And so we've already seen this kind of humility, this kind of humble faith, that is required for entrance into the kingdom of God, to, for, for people who desire to be in, in Jesus, Jesus' kingdom. And so um, in this picture, this story, first of all, we're going to see a Pharisee. And remember, the, the Pharisees were, were people who um, were um, tended to be, at least, some of them, prideful and, and self-righteous. So we've, we've seen this already. We've seen that uh, there were these, these members of the religious ruling class called Pharisees. Um, and they, their, their specialty was uh, really knowing the Old Testament law backwards and forwards. And not only that, but they also put it into practice really well. And they followed the law to the letter. But what they were also doing was that, thinking that these outward deeds of keeping the law and of trying to be perfect in doing all of the right things uh, was for them how to gain God's approval. And oftentimes it would become a source of pride for them. And so we see this is something that Jesus confronts with Pharisees throughout his ministry. Um, so Jesus often had harsh words for the Pharisees. The other character in this parable is the tax collector. And as we've also already seen, um, tax collectors, on the other hand, different from Pharisees, were really kind of the antithesis to the uh, man-made righteousness of, of, the, of the Pharisees. They were looked, up, looked down upon for their unscrupulous and often dishonest dealings and collecting taxes for the Roman government. These were usually Jewish 
uh, people who were put in this position to do this. Um, and oftentimes they would make great profit from uh, overcharging uh, people, their uh, Jewish kinsmen, um, for uh, their taxes. Or they would skim off some for themselves. And, and people knew this about them, but they really couldn't do anything about it because they were collaborators with the Roman government, the Roman authority, and so they, they really couldn't do anything except for despise tax collectors, and that's what they did. So tax collectors, generally speaking, were, were despised. In fact, you see that often they are lumped in the same group um, or category as sinners and prostitutes. In fact, you know, the Pharisees would often talk about, well, Jesus, what's with Jesus? He, he eats with sinners and tax collectors, or publicans is another word for tax collector in, in the New Testament, and, and prostitutes. And so they were lumped in this category of just sinners that people despised. They could not stand them. Now, Pharisees, again, they were the religious leaders. They were highly respected, while the tax collectors, again, were, were despised. But with the Pharisees, the, the pride of at least some of them, and, and, you know, we know that not all the Pharisees were like this. Not all of them were self-righteous. Not all of them were prideful and contemptuous towards others. But for some of them, ironically, what disqualified them was the very thing that they believed was going to get them in in God's kingdom. And that was their self-righteousness. So, Jesus uses this parable then in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 9. And we're going to read that together. Again, to illustrate these two very opposite responses to God. One is self-righteousness. One is humble faith. So starting in verse 9, here's what Luke records. Luke writes, He also told the parable to some I'm sorry, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves and treated others with contempt. And then Jesus, he goes on to record what Jesus says. He says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But then the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his, just, his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So again, here we have see the, the subject of this parable is really self-righteous pride versus humble faith. And we're talking this morning about what, how humble faith is truly what is required to be a part of God's kingdom. Humble faith was what the gospel uh, says, says that is, is how we come to Jesus Christ. So, Let's give. Uh, uh, let's look um, first at what Luke says. Uh, who, who Luke says is the target audience here of this parable. He starts by, out by saying he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. So that's verse nine. Those who trusted in themselves and that they were righteous. In other words, uh, they were self-confident because of because really they thought that they were righteous by doing all of the right things. So not only were they confident, but it wasn't just that they were confident in their righteousness, but it was that they were confident that they were righteous. It was, it was not just, it really is a different, there's a little bit different meaning there because um, to say that they were confident because of their righteousness would imply that they were actually being righteous when it really came down to it. And that's not to say that they weren't doing good things and doing good deeds, but, but really we see throughout Scripture that that does not constitute true, true righteousness. But what the problem here was was that they thought that they were righteous. 
And that's what their confidence was in. That they thought that all of the things that they were doing was cause for God to look upon them and smile and say, wow, that is my, boy, that, that, one of my favorites right there. One of my, my chosen children. And yet, uh, that's not what we see here. It's really that Jesus is speaking to those who, um, who place their trust in their own false righteousness, their own misconception of righteousness in their own lives. And so uh, this person believes that on the basis of their works, they'll receive approval from God and entrance into the, the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is just pointing out the absolute falseness of this, this way of thinking. And not only that, these people Jesus is addressing looked down on everybody else. So it says in the end of verse 9 there, it says that they treated others with contempt. And so their mindset wasn't just that they were so good, but actually that everybody else in comparison was so bad that uh, they, these other people were undeserving of God's favor and his love. And you know, that's basically what people do uh, when they become self-righteous, self-righteous, they really start, they begin to see others as bad and themselves as good. They look condescendingly. They, as it says, they um, treated, treat others with contempt. And so you see these uh, two attitudes that, or this first attitude of, of self-righteousness, and then we'll see the next um, uh, represented by the tax collector as we get into the story here. Um, so this, that sets up the parable. Uh, who it's given to, who it's directed to, and what is the problem that the self-righteous Pharisees uh, were experiencing, what they had, what was the, the dark spot on their, their heart. So we see now that, that there's this contrasting between two characters um, and um, they, they, as it goes on to, to say in the following verses, verse 10 and following, that these two men, as was customary for Jews at that time, they went up to the temple to pray. So it was customary for a couple of times of day uh, of the day that Jewish people, if they lived in Jerusalem near the temple, they might go to the temple to just offer prayers. So one of these people who went was this Pharisee. The other one was the tax collector. And first we see a little bit, a, a great picture actually, into the heart of the Pharisee in the prayer that he prays in verses 11 and 12. What his attitude of self-righteousness and contempt, um, how it showed itself. So his prayer is this, he, and let me read this again to you. He says, God, thank you that I'm not like other men. Uh, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, adulterers or, or even like this tax collector over here. God, thank you that I am not like them. I mean, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I get. And that's his prayer. And his prayer is basically a prayer of self-praise. Uh, one where he is exalting all of the great things that he does. This guy's problem was not low self-esteem. Um, that, was, that was not his problem. And, um, if, if this guy were alive today, this Pharisee, he would be the, the person who would be posting selfies of himself at the temple saying, hey, here's me uh, fasting. You know, you can tell that I haven't had anything to eat for two days this week. Um, here's me giving my tithe here at the temple. And it's interesting that, uh, and it was just self-focused. His focus was just on me. He had an eye problem, you know. I this, I that. I fast twice a week. I, I give and I give, I tithe um, on everything that I, I get. I am so much better than these people. I'm not like them. And he believed that God was blessed to actually have someone like him on, on his team. He believed that he was, he was something that, uh, uh, someone that God would, would actually want to be 
kind of part of his inner circle because, his, because of his righteousness. And so his prayer was not, God, I need your mercy, but instead it was, God, thanks that I'm so good. And that's the picture that here that we get of this Pharisee. And then we have the tax collector who comes into the picture. This, the tax collector, again, he, he's this, this sinner um, who would seem to be on the opposite end of the spectrum as far as man-made righteousness um, from, the, from this um, Pharisee. But his prayer is one of humility and one of repentance, one where he's asking God for mercy. You look in, in, at verse 13 where uh, it records his prayer. Before it does that, he, it says this. It says um, that this tax collector would not even lift his eyes toward heaven. That's how broken he was over sin. Not only that, but it says that he wouldn't even come near the temple sanctuary. He, was, he stood afar off. And he wouldn't lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast out of his humility, out of his realization of his, the realization of his guilt. I mean, have you ever been in that kind of a place? Have you ever been so humbled, so aware of your offense against somebody else that you couldn't, you didn't even want to approach them, you didn't even want to be near them, you didn't even want to look them in the eye, um, and all you can do is say, I am guilty and I am so sorry. We probably don't come to those places as often as we should or could. But sometimes we find ourselves in, in that place. That's what this, really what this tax collector was experiencing, experiencing, at, experiencing at that time. Not even being able to look up to heaven. I've told stories about our dog Mocha before, and you all know how, how, what a bad dog she is. And uh, she, um, however, she's got this thing about her that when she gets in trouble, before she gets in trouble, she knows she's in trouble. You have, anybody have dogs like that? Nobody has a cat like that, I can guarantee you that. Okay, but, but Mocha, our dog Mocha, she would do this. So, so you know, if she would... Um, Let's say go out and she'd be in the backyard and she'd maybe kill one of our chickens, okay? Um, or worse yet, she would go kill one of the neighbor's chickens. That has happened before. Um, or maybe she's dug her way under the fence, which she has done numerous times and went out cruising Beaumont for the whole night. Um, when I would come out the next morning, I would always know. Almost before I noticed the hole dug under the ground or the dead chicken laying in the grass, um, I would almost know that she did something wrong because she would be kind of at one corner of the yard, sitting there, not looking. Normally she would run up, she wants to play, she'd have some toy in her mouth and she'd be coming up to me trying to get me to, to take the toy from her and throw it and stuff like that. But when she knows she's in trouble, she'll go off and sit in a corner of the, in, of, of the yard and she'll just kind of look away. She won't even acknowledge my presence. And uh, I, then that's when I know, okay, Mocha, what did you do? You know? And uh, so sometimes she gets in trouble. Sometimes I go up there, okay, you know, uh, I'll say, okay, you're, you're remorseful, so I'll, I'll forgive you. But uh, really, that's, that's kind of the, the picture that we see with this tax collector. This tax collector is so aware of his sin. So broken over it, so remorseful that he won't even go near the, the temple sanctuary. He's probably standing off in some outer court of the Gentiles, not wanting to, to come near. And as a Jew, he could do that, but he didn't feel like he was worthy to, to do that. And so, not only that, he wouldn't even lift his eyes towards heaven, but again, as we already read, his prayer is... God be merciful to me, a sinner, as he's beating his chest. That wasn't, you know, in, in those days, beating your chest wasn't like we see, you know, um, when somebody scores a touchdown in football and, you know, I'm great. Um, this was a sign of complete and utter humility. 
And that's what this, this tax collector does. And then as the rest of the parable uh, unfolds, we see the consequences of the position that the Pharisee took, the prideful self-righteousness and contempt for everyone else, as opposed to the consequences for the, the tax collector who humbled himself before God. And, and Jesus goes on to say it was that it was because of the humble, repentant faith. This is in verse 14. The humble, repentant faith of the tax collector that Jesus says this. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Now, why is that? Well, he goes on in verse 15 to say the reason for that. And the reason is because, Jesus says, for everyone who, exa who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so, what is it that Jesus is saying here? What is, what is, what's, what's he teaching here? Well, I, I see that there are two things. Um, first thing that, that Jesus is saying in this parable is that there is no justification. Because remember, he said, this man went to his house, went down to his house justified, but not the other. So he's saying, first of all, that there is no justification, or in other words, let's go back to um, defining terms here. Um, justification, remember, is uh, being what? Declared righteous, okay? Justification, being de declared righteous by God. So um, there is no justification or being declared righteous, and thus no entrance into God's kingdom for those who trust in their own righteousness. That was the problem of the Pharisee. That's what he was trusting in, but that was the absolute wrong thing to be placing his faith and trust in in order to get into the kingdom. So the self-righteous today, then in our context, which by the way, we tend to think, you know, there are people outside of the church who are self-righteous, and, and that's true. In fact, it's, it's not always true in a kind of a a mean or malicious or arrogant, haughty kind of a way. But there are people outside of the church, people outside of a relationship with Christ, people who are not Christians, who have become convinced by what they've been told by other people, by what they read, by what they see everywhere, that the way that you get into the kingdom of God, that the way that you get to heaven is just by doing good things. And if you have enough good things in your life to outweigh the bad things in your life, then God will kind of, as he's weighing the balance, you know, and the scales at the pearly gates there, he'll go, eh, okay, you're in, you know. Your good things out outweighed your bad things. And, and so, yeah, you made it in. And unfortunately, that's a kind of self-righteousness that much of our world is trapped in. In other words, they believe that Hey, if I just am a basically a good person, I do enough of the right things, God's going to let me into his kingdom. God's going to let me into his heaven. And yet Jesus turns this on its head and says, no, this is precisely the thing that will keep you out of my heaven. The thing that will keep you out of the kingdom of God is trusting in your own goodness because nobody is good enough. And so that's certainly a way in which this can play itself out among non-believers. But you know, also in the church, it can be really easy for us to start to believe this lie that because I do X, Y, and Z, because I, because I follow this list of rules, that God is going to have special favor on me, that I'm going to be especially um, approved by God. And that's not the way that it works in God's family, in his kingdom. We're all approved by God, but only on the basis of what Jesus Christ has done, not on anything that we have done. And that's just the gospel, pure and simple, that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done 
on the cross, and it's not anything that we have done. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. That means yourselves. That means that the faith that we're saved through doesn't even come from, ourself, from us. God has to give it to us. It's not of works. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. I might have gotten some of those phrases backwards. But it's all God. And it's not on us. The problem with this, right, with this Pharisee was saying, hey, my righteousness, it's all on me. It's all because of me. When God's, the way that God has established his truth and what permits somebody into his kingdom is the exact opposite, and that is to trust in the righteousness of Christ. And so there's justification for those who come to God in humble faith. That's what the tax collector illustrates. It's those who recognize their complete sinfulness and their total helplessness to make it right, to make themselves right, apart from the mercy and the grace of God. So this is is so clear, what Jesus is teaching about what what is... um, the way into the kingdom of God. What is the way to be all in as a a Christ follower? It starts here with humble faith. And you know, that really is the good news of the gospel for us. It is is good news. Again, literally, the gospel means good news. And this is great news because really none of us is inherently good on our own, in in, in ourselves. Um, We... Um, are not good and we are not righteous. That's clear in Scripture. It's not as though we're born good and we're good until that one fateful day when we finally mess up. No, we're born into sin. We're born with sin by inheritance. And so we all start out not as good, but as unrighteous people who are in need of justification, to be declared righteous by a holy and just God. And that only comes through faith in Christ. But that is, that is great news, um, that we don't have to trust in our own goodness for God to save us, for him to give us entrance into his kingdom, for him to give us eternal life and forgiveness of sin and eternal relationship with him. But if we're counting on the opposite, or we're counting on our own self-righteousness, then we are going to be disappointed and miss the kingdom of God, just like that Pharisee. Unless we put faith and trust in Christ, his work on the cross, and we're given his righteousness. So humble faith, which is marked by admitting our sin in repentance Um, and that trusts Jesus' work on the cross is the only remedy for sin that we're ever given. It's the only way to have true faith that saves. And so, where does that bring us? Well, I think we all need to recognize that even for us who are saved, for us who are already in, we have this scary tendency to sin that we need to make sure we keep submitting to God's control. And not only that, but we don't fall into this trap of thinking, you know what, I'm pretty good. You know, I do some pretty good things. And, and so I know because of that, God's pretty much given me the thumbs up most of the time. But no, being a follower of Christ is marked by Humility, humble faith. That was so evident in so many of the people who have gone before us, not only in the examples that we've seen already here in the book of Matthew, but I I think about somebody like John Newton. You know, John Newton was a, a pastor in England. He was the guy who wrote this little known song, Amazing Grace. And, uh, but before that, before he was a pastor, before he wrote that great hymn, he was a miserable sinner. 
He was a slave trader. He was a captain on a slave trading ship. His life was not what anyone would say, hey, that's, there's a godly person. In fact, he was just the opposite. But he placed faith and trust in Jesus Christ and everything changed from that point. And at the end of his life, I believe it was in a letter that he wrote to his wife, he writes this. He says, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. See, that's humble faith right there. One that recognizes our sin, but also recognizes that we have a great Savior who saves us, has saved us from our sin. And because of that, we have eternal life. Because of that, we are in God's kingdom, his family. So, what is our response then? What is our response? I think we have to ask ourselves, have I placed any um, emphasis or confidence in any of my own righteousness? Have I been legalistic? Have I been moralistic? Thinking that doing these good things actually makes God love me more or think that I am a greater one of his servants than the next person. We have to confront ourselves with that question and if it's true that we've done that at all, we need to go before God in repentance and say, Lord, forgive me and take that attitude which is so contrary to the truth. Take it away from me. Or maybe our response is more along the lines of um, seeing the lost in the way that God sees them, with compassion, not with contempt, not looking down upon them, not thinking they are untouchable, that they are filthy and dirty because that's how we once were. In fact, we need to be able to say, instead of God, like the Pharisee, God, thank you that I'm not like that person but to be able to say, thank you, God, that by your grace, I'm no longer there. And I don't want that person to be there any longer. So that speaks to our call to make disciples who make disciples, to get the gospel to people who need to hear it, who people who are lost, instead of withholding it from them because of their sinfulness. Because who are we to withhold what God is so graciously and generously given to us. So there's some ways that we can take this parable and, and apply them to our lives and, and respond with uh, maybe doing something different than what we've been doing. Um, great, the, the, but the great com- takeaway from, from this parable, again, is that God is merciful to sinners. And that's, for us, the greatest news that anybody could ever give someone that God is merciful to sinners that means that he's merciful to us let's pray together father we do thank you for your great mercy that um, it doesn't depend on our goodness um, in terms of uh, us getting into your kingdom in terms of us having a relationship with you Lord, we thank you that despite our sin, you have reached down into our lives and lifted us up out of that place of darkness and place of enslavement, and you've made us free by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that. Help us to guard against self-righteousness and pride in our own lives. Lord, where we have fallen prey to that temptation, Lord, we pray that you would, we, we confess that to you and we, we ask that you would forgive us. We need your mercy. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who has never realized that you have made it so easy to enter into the kingdom of God, that it's not based on me doing all of these 
things, jumping through these hoops, doing all the right things, following the right rules. But it's about placing faith in Jesus Christ and what you've done on the cross to take the penalty of our sin as our substitute, Lord Jesus, and to cancel our debt that we have against you. Lord, that is mercy. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.